I've pulled the last of the year's young onions. The garden is bare now. The ground is cold, brown and old. What is left of the day flames in the maples at the corner of my eye. I turn, a cardinal vanishes. By the cellar door, I wash the onions, then drink from the icy metal spigot. Once, years back, I walked beside my father among the windfall pears. I can't recall our words. We may have strolled in silence, but I still see him bend that way, left hand braced on knee, creaky, to lift and hold to my eye a rotten pear. In it, a hornet spun crazily, glazed in slow, glistening juice. It was my father I saw this morning, waving to me from the trees. I almost called to him until I came close enough to see the shovel leaning where I had left it in the flickering deep green shade. White rice steaming, almost done. Sweet green peas fried in onions. Shrimp braised in sesame oil and garlic. And my own loneliness. What more could I, a young man, want? I don't know. I, I used to have a garden in Pennsylvania, you know, and I grew onions. And this is just about, I guess, clearing the onions out and finding uh, some, you know, leftover young onions that were there. And I, but I'm not, I'm not sure what it's about either. I guess it's about the invention of solitude or the discovery of solitude or, or uh, loneliness and death. And I wanted somehow to honor uh, food making, which is a con continuous mystery to me. Uh, this is called Eating Together. Uh, eating Together. In the steamer is the trout, seasoned with slivers of ginger, two sprigs of green onion, and sesame oil. We shall eat it with rice for lunch. Brothers, sister, my mother, who will taste the sweetest meat of the head, holding it between her fingers, deftly, the way my father did weeks ago. Then he lay down to sleep like a snow-covered road, winding through pines older than him, without any travelers, and lonely for no one. Well, I, I don't blame you know, young people for being intimidated by poetry, because it seems to me, particularly lyric poetry, I'm not sure that poems belong in the same category as uh, like novels and essays and short stories. And poems are strange. They're, um, they belong in a whole category uh, of like synchronicity or coincidence. I think experience of coincidence is the closest thing we have to the experience of poetry. In fact, I think uh, a lyric poem is nothing less than the manifestation of coincident order in language. Again, the poem ends in loneliness and you know I must have been a young man uh, fascinated and uh, I don't know bollocks by my own loneliness you know and uh, I don't know well you know food is so important to me personally I'm sure it has to do with my culture uh, 
uh, you know, the Chinese culture is obsessed with food, you know, and uh, a lot of information I think is passed on from uh, generation to generation by the, the, the kinds of food that are passed on, the kinds of food that are uh, uh, the foods that are uh, encouraged and discouraged, and uh, uh, you know every family has its own recipe for certain things. Uh, I had a friend who read th this poem uh, about the trout, and uh, uh, he corrected me. You know, he said, "Well, we don't make it with trout; we make it with flounder." And I said, "Well, every family makes it different." You know, so uh, I think with the Chinese uh, tradition, it's very uh, yeah. Food is a big it's a big issue. You know, and it's a, in my family particularly. There are, uh, there are eleven of us now, and we get together every evening for dinner. And so that's a big, uh, uh, every evening it's a, it's a big issue. Uh, uh, my brother and his wife and their daughters and my mother and my sister and uh, her husband and my family, we all get together. We all cook. We all eat together every evening. And, uh, and there's something very, uh, I don't know, the convergence of uh, generations and the uh, yeah, that that's been really important for years, and my gr my mother's mother used to live with us, and so all of us would uh, converge and eat, and and there'd be a lot of storytelling around food, and uh, uh, yeah, so it was a really important part of uh, uh, my own growing up. And I I know this, <clears throat> I'm Chinese, but I was born in Indonesia. The year I was born, 50,000 Chinese were rounded up and killed. My father was part of that. Uh, he was rounded up. He was not killed. He escaped. Uh, and after he escaped and took his family with him, uh, in, in, uh, th it, within ten, a 10 year span, while, while I was in, uh, the year I was born was right in the middle of a 10 year span in which they killed fi uh, half a million Chinese in Indonesia. And uh, so I grew up with a kind of experience that uh, um, somehow th that was just the world, you know, uh, political upheaval and uh, social unrest. And, um, and so when we finally came to this country, this country was at war with an Asian country, which meant, uh, and, you know, it wasn't that long ago, but it didn't seem to matter to the people where I was growing up, whether I was Chinese or Vietnamese. Or, I, mean, I, I was, you know, I looked Vietnamese. And, a lot of the people, they had lost relatives, uncles and brothers in the Vietnam War. and So a lot of that hatred was directed toward me. And even though I was trying to explain myself, like, no, I'm not Vietnamese, I'm Chinese, you've got the wrong person. Um, I think ultimately the feeling of being outside probably contributed to my, I'm guessing now, very likely contributed to my wanting to write poetry or, or to make art of any kind because I think ultimately anybody who wants to make art is somehow outside of things, you know. And uh, it's the experience of being outside, experience of being strange, uh, I think ultimately gets enacted in the poems. I, I don't know when I'm writing the poem, I don't know how, uh, how much I actually experience my own... Uh, refugee status, you know. I think I experience uh, a kind of dislocation, a kind of uh, uh, strangeness about being on planet Earth. <laughs> but that might be, that, that may or may not have to do with my being a refugee, you know. I think this, I think my being a refugee is coincident with uh, any soul's experience of being uh, on planet. Maybe any, any soul is a refugee from heaven, you know. I'm always confused by my own uh, experiences here on earth. And uh, I think that's, <clears throat> I write poems in order to try to understand that experience, you know. And it seems that my life, I've been just looking for a safe place all of my life, uh, re a refuge. And it seems to me that language, particularly um, poetry, is, is a safe place. Uh, 
is a kind of a shelter and a refuge. And I'm not sure what I mean by that, except uh, it's a visceral experience. When I'm writing poems, uh, my own experience is that I'm creating a safe place for myself. Uh, it might have something to do with the, uh, the possibility that my own identity was uh, nearly erased. Uh, you know, when I was born, uh, uh, many Chinese lost their lives in Indonesia, and my parents n nearly lost their lives. And uh, so maybe that's what writing poetry is about, ultimately. It's about uh, discovering who we are, being friends with who we are, uh, getting friendly with your own mind. I think over the years of writing and trying to understand writing, uh, trying to understand or, tr or trying to formulate for myself a kind of formal aesthetic um, point of view, I think the ancient aste uh, Chinese aesthetic has been the one that has been, been most influential to me. The, the whole idea, you know, that uh, uh, that poetic mind uh, was a kind of yoga. You know, the ancient Chinese believed that there are kinds of yogas, uh, th and that poetry was the royal yoga, that the practice of painting and poetry uh, were the practice of what they called uh, universal mind or cosmic mind. And so that, that whole belief uh, and thousands of years of that, of that practice in China I think has influenced me uh, a lot. I guess when I try to formulate some sort of aesthetic I'm, I'm just drawing from Emerson, from Lao Tzu, from you know, the sutras and from uh, mystical Judeo-Christian traditions and uh, they all seem to me to point to the same uh, thing, you know. Uh, and that is uh, checking your ego and letting something bigger speak in the poem. You know? Well, in my own practice, I, you know, there, there are many kinds of poems. Uh, some poems uh, come uh, full-blown, and if I make one change, the whole poem is ruined. And so I know, you know, I have to develop a kind of dialogue with the work so that I listen to the work. And if the work feels like it's whole and it's complete, then I'm done with it. But a lot of times, because I'm not concentrating or my mind isn't uh, as present as it should be, I get pieces of the poem, and so the whole poem doesn't emerge. And so I have to go back and revise. So some, the, the poem uh, that I've worked on the longest, it took me 11 years to write. And the poem that I... Uh, worked on the least maybe three minutes, you know, so anywhere in between that. And it feels to me that I'm on the job 24 hours a day. You know, the, the minute I wake up, I feel as if I'm in the presence of a poem. My, my, the, whole, the whole cosmos, the whole world seems to exist to me uh, like a giant poem. And I could begin anywhere and... Uh, so I'm on the job all the time. I see the beginnings of poems everywhere. It's almost maddening, you know. There's so much to write about. Uh, I just don't know where, where to begin. And there's a kind of grief attached to that, too, because I feel there are hundreds of thousands of poems available every, everywhere I look. But if I start to write, it means that I'm only writing one poem, and all those other poems have to be said, kind of said no to, you know. And so that whole experience is a weird experience, but it does feel to me that the po that the world is just exists in a condition of a saturated presence and meaning and being, and sometimes it's difficult just to rescue a poem out of that stream of overabundance of being, just to rescue a little moment's uh, clarity out of that. You know, my own love for poetry came from this discovery that when I, uh, that every time I heard my parents recite ancient Chinese poetry, or uh, the poetry of uh, from the Old and New Testaments, that my own, my own experience was that uh, I was hearing language uh, language that was manifesting 
something older and something uh, mysterious and something uh, uh, beautiful and mysterious that I couldn't account for, and I wanted to be a part of that. My, my, I remember my parents would sometimes recite beautiful ancient poems, and I could see that they were weeping while they were reciting, which uh, moved me and uh, made me feel actually uh, like I was introduced to some sort of mystery, you know, that my mother would recite something and look away, and I would realize that she was kind of weeping, and there were tears in her eyes. And I thought she had this relationship with these poems that I couldn't quite understand, you know. Uh, so that fascinated me. I didn't start learning to read uh, poetry in English, although I was reading the Bible, you know, I guess I was reading the Psalms and the Gospels and uh, the book of Genesis and Exodus, and those books just f knocked me out. I thought they were weird and mysterious and uh, otherworldly, and uh, there were parts of me, I was able to read, you know, things like Genesis and Exodus that didn't make any rational sense. It didn't, didn't bother me, you know, it made figurative sense to me, emotional sense. And I think ultimately those kinds of poets, you know, the poets that I loved, all they, they, they propose poetry as a mode of being in the world, which is, uh, I guess, ultimately a religious uh, uh, proposition, right? You know, the religious figures, all they propose prayer or contemplation or meditation as a mode of being in the world. It's not just something you do in your room. So I, I've always been fascinated by poetry that proposes that, you know. I think one has to uh, inhabit a particular uh, state of consciousness in order to uh, notice uh, coincidence or synchronicity in the world. And it could be, in fact, that the more open we are to it, the more we realize, the more we maybe begin to notice that that's the deepest thing going on at any particular time, you know. That cause and effect is a kind of surface condition. But maybe, but maybe down deep, uh, at a deeper level, at a quantum level of reality, and I do think that writing poems is, is dealing with language on, at a quantum level, you know, uh, uh, but it seems to me that when one opens, when you open your mind to a particular condition or, or a, a, a particular state of consciousness, then the, the synchronicity, uh, synchronicities and coincidences begin to emerge and begin to yield themselves, it feels to me, begin to reveal themselves in language. And, uh, Poems are small paradigms, uh, or, or DNA is the paradigm for a poem. That is, as much information in as little space as possible. And when we read a poem, maybe the mind of the reader is a kind of, uh, 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 like a solvent. Like you drop the DNA, which is the poem, in the mind of the reader, and the poem begins to blo blossom, begins to bloom with all these meanings. But of course, the information I'm talking about in a poem isn't just data. You know, and it's not necessarily autobiographical information. It's emotional information, spiritual information, soulful information, erotic information, intellectual information, all of that stuff packed into a poem. You know, I don't know if this is going to be useful or not, but it seems to me that because a poem is a score for the human voice, uh, a voice implies a speaker. So in a way, every poem is a portrait of a speaker. You know, whatever the ostensible subject of the poem is, the real subject is the speaker. Sometimes we get kind of lost in the ostensible subject. We're talk we read a poem, we think, for instance, in eating together or eating alone. I think those are about eating and all those other things. But I think ultimately what I was trying to construct was a, a speaking person who had value in the world. And, and for me, that, that's been the whole project, is can I create a, uh, uh, a portrait of a speaker that is precious in the world? You know, the ancient Greeks called it uh, uh, creating a, pers a person who, if that person were destroyed, it would be lamentable. Uh, we, would, we would have to weep. 
And, and so that was uh, the ancient Greeks, that was their way of uh, conferring value onto heroes. But I think we don't write about heroes anymore. We write about mind. We write about heart. You know, th that's ultimately uh, uh, the subject. And what is the v value of the, the mind in the poem? The quality of the imagination is ultimately what, what they're encountering in the poem. So that's what I think they, they should be writing about. They should be interrogating the quality of the imagination in the poem, the quality of the mind, the heart, the soul in the poem.